بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ورحمة بعد. Who can remind what we did last week? What were we doing last week? The conquest of Egypt and and uh, Jerusalem and uh, Damascus, Bilad al-Sham. So we did all of that last week. Uh, Insha'Allah ta'ala, today we will begin uh, the story of the conquest of uh, the conquest of the Sassanid Empire or the Persian Empire. And um, again, I, we get back to the issue of sources and the issue of details. And when you look at the Arab and Muslim uh, side of the events, the historians, they of course, they have their uh, important timeline, they have the details of quote-unquote our side. However, our sources don't have anything that was going on on the other side. And what we have now in our times is that actually a lot of modern scholarship has been done trying to look at the events from the other side's perspective and what's going on from the side of the, the Persians or the Sassanids. And I think that's very fascinating that uh, we're now able to see what's happening on the other side of things. Now, what is the Sassanid Empire? Uh, the Sassanid Empire is the more proper name for the Persian Empire. Empire, and it is the last of the great uh, pre-Islamic Iranian empires. And the Sassanids ruled from around 220 CE to around 651 uh, CE. And before the Sassanid, it was the ancient Parthian Empire of Iran. So these are the two main empires that every world knowledgeable person should be familiar with, the Parthian, the ancient, uh, Egyptian, the ancient uh, Iranians, and then you have the uh, Sassanids. And uh, the Sassanids controlled at their peak, at their zenith, they controlled pretty much most of the modern Middle East. The, the countries today would be Iran, Iraq, the entire strip of Eastern Arabia. So this includes Bahrain, Qatar, Oman, uh, Yemen. They uh, actually, the Sassanid Empire actually controlled the entire strip of uh, Southern Arabia and Eastern Arabia. And they inc uh, at times they even conquered Bilad the Sham. So multiple times in their history, the Sassanids were ruling over Jerusalem and Damascus. And that also goes back to the issue that the Yehud were allowed to come back to uh, the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, during the reign of the Sassanids. Because the Sassanids were of what religion? We should all know. They were of what religion? They were fire worshippers. They were fire worshippers or the Zor Zor Zoroastrians, okay? So they were Majus, the Zoroastrians. And so they, by and large, were very sympathetic to other faiths compared to the Christians. They didn't really have a major problem with the Yehud. And in fact, they were closer to the Yehud than the Christians were. So this, the, the Persians actually allowed the Yehud to come and rebuild the temple, uh, to come and be uh, worshipping in the Holy Land again. And so the Sassanids were at war, as we know, with the Byzantine. We know this from the Quran. Alif Lam Mim. So there was this constant struggle between the Byzantine or the Roman Empire and the uh, Sassanid Empire. And the Sassanids were absolute rivals in every sense of the term to the Roman Empire. They had an equally powerful civilization with its own literature, its own religion, its own economy, its own coinage, its own uh, arts, its own poetry, it's completely rivaling. There's really no overlap. As we said, the language differs, the, 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 the religion differs. So each one of them wants to be the one dominant force in the world. And one thing that we as Muslims don't quite appreciate or understand, the Sassanid Empire reached its utmost zenith in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. It was its most powerful in around 620 CE. Now, this is absolutely amazing because, why? Why is this amazing? If it was, the, at this stage, when even the Byzantine Empire is defeated, and it appears that the Sassanids are going to basically take over the world, the Prophet ﷺ, the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ predict that the tide is going to change. Not just that, but in fact, the Persian Empire will no longer uh, be. And in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, the Emperor uh, Khusro, the Emperor Khusro, actually achieved some of the greatest victories ever 
against the Byzantine Empire that the Sassanids had ever seen. And this is the reference in early Mecca. So Khusru ruled for, I don't quote me, but around 30, 35 years. He was a long emperor. He ruled for a long time. And the Sassanid Empire reached its zenith under Khusru. The same one whom Allah Azza wa Jal references indirectly, Ghulibat al-Rum. Who defeated the Romans? This Khusru guy. Okay, so the Romans were defeated by the army and under the leadership of uh, Khusro, and Khusro was considered to be really uh, the, the, the last of the great kings because after him, Khalas, immediate decline, immediately after his death. This was completely unpredictable, and this is the whole point of the predictions of our Prophet. And of course, uh, as we talked about in last week as well. Uh, the, in, the quick change, the quick success, the quick demise of the Sassanid Empire and the success of the Muslims still remains an issue of great controversy and interest in modern historians because the fact of the matter is it is inexplicable, it's very difficult to understand. Imagine a mighty empire literally within less than a decade. It is 500 years old, 450 years old. And it reaches its utmost power. In the time of the Prophet they conquered Damascus. Can you believe? The Sassanids conquered Damascus. They're already now in Bilad al-Sham. They think they're going to take over the rest of, of the Byzantine Empire. And lo and behold, in less than 10 years, khalas, the entire empire is destroyed. So these are obviously very big questions for every historian. And as I mentioned last week, modern historians have a long list of why this happened. And all of these reasons, we don't have any problem believing them, but we say who caused these reasons to take place, okay? We have no problem saying, yes, this was also a issue, this was also an issue, but it's not just coincidence that all of these instances happen to coincide the very eve that the Prophet and the Sahaba are going to invade, and all of these issues come together. And the main reason that is very clear now when we look at the other side, what's happening inside, because our historians did not know what's happening inside that much. Okay, if you look at At-Tabari, you look at Ibn Kathir, you look at our historians, there's just vague references to what's happening. But now modern historians, they have access to Persian historians, Sassanid historians. They have access to historians of other civilizations that we can learn much more from about what's going on. So in a nutshell, I'm not gonna go into that detail, neither am I that interested. But in a nutshell, the primary cause that is blamed was that the extra power of Khusro made his family and generals extra greedy. And they all were plotting and planning to carve up or at least get the biggest share of the pie, even in his lifetime. And this is the problem of extra wealth and extra power, okay? And we all are familiar with this, that if somebody becomes very, very rich and they were mediocre or average, who becomes his worst enemies, his friends and his cousins and his family? Because all of a sudden, all of this wealth is coming in. So in essence, this is what's happening with Khusro, is that all of this success is making his own, and he had over a dozen children. Uh, by the way, Khusro, uh, it is said that he had a, a harem uh, of, how many guests? MashaAllah, Muwahid had a MashaAllah, Rajul had a MashaAllah. How many guests? 100? 18? Close. 3,000, MashaAllah, Zubarakallah. It's all right, calm down, Bismillah. <laughs> 3,000 he had. 3,000, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. All the guys need some time to let that sink in, okay, inshallah. So the point being that uh, he was very wealthy, very powerful, of the mightiest of all uh, of the, of the uh, Sassanid emperors. So what's going to happen when he has all of these military conquests and then he has all of these sons? What's going to happen, you tell me? The very sons that he's so proud of, the very children, the very army generals that he's promoted, they're all salivating to get a piece of the pie. And political intrigues begin, even at this point in time, okay? They already start wondering what's gonna happen, who's gonna tar take charge, etc., etc. So, already there was disunity, talk of civil war, and things got from bad to worse, basically immediately after his death, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And remember, it was Khusro himself, whom the Prophet corresponded with, the same, this one, 
It was Khusra himself whom the Prophet Sallallahu corresponded with. And we all know that Khusra was the most, and you can tell his mizaj, his character, that you know, in any type of diplomacy, you just have to retain some dignity, right? Doesn't matter, it's just what politicians do. It's what diplomats do. You retain some dignity. But Khusra, you can see his, his yani the, the type of Jabbar, Mutakabbir type of personality, that when the letter of the Prophet ﷺ comes, what does he do? He literally tears it up. And we all know the greatest sin in the eyes of Allah is kibr. And when you have kibr against Allah and His Messenger, what's going to happen? And this is a big sign and a big lesson for us about the dangers of kibr, the dangers of arrogance. That Khusro demonstrated his kibr against the Messenger. And anybody who is arrogant against the Messenger is arrogant against Allah. And so, what did our Prophet ﷺ say? And again, we do not, it, it's so easy for us to read these ahadith. The Sassanid Empire was at its most powerful when our Prophet ﷺ said this. Imagine the mightiest civilization that you cannot see the end of. And somebody comes and says, Khalas, this is it, it's going to go. Nobody's going to believe you. But what did our Prophet ﷺ say? He tore up my letter. Allah will tear his kingdom up. Every single witch and every way. And wallahi, this is exactly what happened after the death of the Prophet ﷺ and during the reign of Bakr and Umar. All of these governors and mini princes, they're all literally fighting in these mini provinces like the Prophet ﷺ predicted. Literally into little pieces like he tore the letter of the Prophet ﷺ up and nobody could have ever understood or predicted. But this is the uh, response and this is the end result of kibr. And by the way, so a little bit of rehash, we talked about this in the seerah. And of course all of you must remember exactly what happened. But just because maybe there's one or two that weren't there that day, for their sake, inshaAllah ta'ala, we can repeat the story. Uh, even though of course all of you know the story, that when uh, Heraclius got the letter, uh, not Heraclius, when uh, uh, Kisra, when uh, uh, Khusro, Khusro is his name, Kisra is his title. Uh, so Khusro is the, 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 the name. So when Khusro got the letter, he then commanded his, his vassal, his governor uh, in Yemen, whose name was Badan. Badan, so there was a portion of Yemen, uh, the eastern portion, that was under Persian control. Okay, the eastern portion of Yemen was under Persian control. So he ordered Badan to go send two spies to Medina. Remember this story vaguely? He ordered Badan to go send two spies to Medina with some fake letter. It is even rumored they might have been assassins or more likely that they were scouts to see how much of an army is needed to go and bring. And so the, the goal was astaghfirullah to bring the Prophet as a prisoner to to. Uh, Khusro himself, just like the Arab, the utmost kibr of this man. So the point of these two spies was to scout out, to see what would happen. And they came under the guise of diplomats. Okay, to this day the CIA works under diplomatic passports wherever they go. This is the reality. They pretend to be diplomats and they go. So as well here, these spies went under diplomats. That we have a letter from uh, Badan. Uh, 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 Khusro was too arrogant even to respond. Khusro is too arrogant even to respond to the letter. So he tells Badan, send these two and, and, and see what you find out about this man. And who remembers the story, what happened to these two men? Now I'm quizzing you. Good. Good, exactly. So those two, em those two emissaries came and the Prophet did not even open the letter. He said, come back tomorrow. He didn't even open it because he knew this is a fake letter. They're not, it's not a serious letter. It's just a, 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 a ruse and um, uh, a trick to get information. So he didn't even open the letter. He said, come back to, them tomorrow. Come back to me tomorrow. So they came back tomorrow morning and the Prophet said, go back to your master and tell him that my Lord has killed his Lord. And the two emissaries were shocked completely because the reference is very clear here that the Lord of their master is Kisra. Their master is Badan and the Lord of Badan is Khusro, Kisra, Khusro. So they're shocked. They come back to Badan 
And of course by this time Badan also knows that Khusro has been killed. And the very same day that the Prophet said to them that tell, go back and tell your Lord was the day Khusro died. And this resulted in the conversion of Badan to Islam. Badan, the governor, became Muslim and that whole region automatically entered under Islam. SubhanAllah. Right? One simple statement. And Badan cut off from Khusro and entered into Islam. And this is the beginning of Mazzaqahum Kulla Mumazzaq. This is the beginning of cutting up the empire into all of these uh, different uh, principalities. And um, Khusro, uh, and his name was uh, Aparwiz, Aparwiz, and from this we, they see he's got our Parvez name, uh, but it's Aparwiz was his name, uh, and it means the conqueror, Aparwiz means the conqueror. Uh, Khusro, in fact, he died a very tragic death, and this is exactly what is expected of somebody who shows kibr to Allah and his messenger. This is exactly what is expected. That um, after one of these major battles and accomplishments, um, and he himself was guilty of trying to get rid of some of his own sons. I mean, wallahi, this is so evil that this is the reality of emperors. Sadly, even some of our own emperors have done the same thing uh, throughout history, especially during the later times, this was unfortunately also a reality. But on their time, it's much more common. So he has all of these sons and the wives that are, or the slave, uh, the slave girls that, he, that have his ear, the ones that basically have control over him are whispering into his ear to kill the other sons. And in the end of the day, he has to make a decision. So he decided against one particular son, that this one's gonna die. So happened, long story short, uh, make a long story short, that particular son did not die. His name was Kavad, he did not die. And he managed to escape, come free. He comes back at the head of an army, and he attacks his own father, the emperor, and imprisons his own father, Khusro. And then, astaghfirullah, he tortures his own father to death. A cruel death. It is said that he ordered one of the, his men to throw arrows one by one into his father who was tied up. Just literally, like playing. Astaghfirullah, this is the reality of... So Allah punished him in this world, before the Akhirah. Allah punished him in this world, before Akhirah. That was the same day that the Prophet said, go back and tell your Lord that my Lord has killed his Lord. Okay? This was the, the end of... of um, uh, Khusro. And then of course, I mean, after Khusro, a series of kings took over, literally in the course of a year and a half, around 12 emperors came one after the other, or leaders or generals. Already you see the civil war happening, okay? Can you imagine after this mighty man who has ruled for three and a half or four decades and he's conquered most of basically Iraq and Iran and, 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 the, and much of the Middle East and Damascus. Now as soon as he dies, what's happening? Within the span of a year or two, one after another, some rule for 40 days, some rule for three months, some rule for a year. Uh, eventually, of course, that was the end of the uh, Sassanid uh, uh, Empire and uh, in the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like the seventh or eighth one. So within the success, this is all happening while the Prophet is in Medina. This is all happening in the course of two years, as we said, around 12 rulers. Some of them from the royal family, and some of them were generals who were trying to make coup d'etats. And each one, one another after another. So you already see the beginning of the end. Okay, Allah Azza wa Jal's qadr is taking place. You already see the beginning of the end, until finally, all of the sons have been killed or died off, and so some bunch of generals come together and they put on the throne one of the daughters of Khusro. And her name was Puran Dukht. Puran Dukht. And of course, Dukht means daughter or, or girl. So Puran was her name, Puran Dukht. They put Puran Dukht on. And this was the famous, uh, or this was the cause of the famous hadith, which is in Sahih Bukhari, which is the very controversial hadith in our times because of uh, the trends and changes in society, they find this hadith problematic. Lan yufliha qawman, uh, qawman wallaw imra, amrahum imra'a. That never will a nation succeed who place a woman under their care, or who place their care basically in the hands of a woman. Hadith is in Bukhari. Now, the hadith is, is very much controversial in our times because it's deemed to be a hadith that is not suitable for the mizaj of, of modern people. It is in Bukhari. It's a hadith that we accept. Uh, but 
Truth be told, and you know that I am not in the least sense of the term progressive, nonetheless, truth be told, there is an alternative, there are two interpretations of the hadith. I have to just comment here, and it's not a detailed explanation of this hadith. Uh, there are two interpretations that go back to early Islam. So this isn't some modernist twist that you're trying to force the hadith to conform to modern sensibilities. The first interpretation, which is very clear, that a woman should not be in charge. This is very explicit from the hadith. لَنْ يُفْلِحَ قَوْمٌ وَلَّوْ أَمْرَهُمْ إِمْرَأَةٌ Okay, no nation that places a woman at its head as its leader shall ever be successful. So this is one interpretation. But there is another interpretation. And it is also classical. And Ibn Hajar himself mentions this. So this is not some progressive interpretation that, that is trying to distort the hadith. It is found in classical literature. And it is a possibility. It's plausible. And that is that the Prophet system was not giving... An amr, he was stating a khabar. He wasn't giving a command. He was making a prediction about that particular civilization. And therefore, it should not be translated as any nation that places a woman at its head shall not be successful. But rather, this particular nation that has now placed a woman as its head shall not be successful ever. Okay, you see the big difference between the two? So the one is the Amr, the other is the Khabar. And linguistically, they're both allowed. It's not as if it's a stretch. And therefore, it's just an interesting twist to add over here because the Hadith does bring about some uh, issues about women, leadership and whatnot. And we should be fair to our tradition and say that this hadith, yes, it has been interpreted in manner A, but it has also been interpreted in manner B. And therefore, it is something that is found in our tradition. In any case, this hadith was said when, uh, when Puran Dukht became the uh, emperor, and uh, immediately after her, uh, basically, one or two other emperors came until finally, the final one was one of the grandchildren of Khusro, uh, Yazdajard III. Yazdajard III was the final emperor of the, uh, of the Sassanid Empire. And, of course, as I already mentioned, the Prophet ﷺ had already predicted the end of the Sassanids in multiple ahadith. In fact, it is pre pretty much mutawatir that in his lifetime he is predicting the end of the Sassanid Empire. Of course, we already mentioned a number of these traditions. Of them, Allah will tear their kingdom up the way that he tore my letter up. Of them is the hadith of Bukhari, if we take it as a khabar and not an amr. And in either circumstance, he is saying, this nation is gone. لَن يُفْلِحَ قَوْمٌ وَلَّوْ أَمْرَ مرات. This nation is gone. Of them, one, what other occasion did he predict the end of the, of the Persian Empire? Who else can tell me? From the seerah. There was a Bedouin that was going to wear the... Uh, not, okay, who? Who, who, who? Huh? Suraqa ibn Malik. The story of Suraqa ibn Malik. Now, when our Prophet ﷺ said this hadith to Suraqa, this is at the pinnacle of Khusro's power. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ, in the entire seerah, one can say, one of the most dangerous times is right now. All alone, fi Sahra, in the middle of the desert. He does not even have weapons to defend himself. And Suraqa, one of the chieftains and leaders of his tribe, has spotted him. And all Suraqa needs to do is to get some help and khalas, they are surrounded. Literally, this is one of the most tense situations in the seerah. And we all know what happened. Three times Suraqa's horse trips, he falls over three times falls over until finally he promises, he goes, okay, I promise, let me just speak to you. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to harm you. And uh, Suraqa spoke to the Prophet and the Prophet said, what will your situation be, O Suraqa, when you wear the bracelets of Kisra? How will you imagine yourself? What is the situation when you will wear the bracelets of Kisra? Now, literally, imagine. The Prophet ﷺ, without any money, weaponry, nothing, he's all alone, all alone. He is telling the one who was about to capture him, don't worry, you're going to wear the symbols of power to the most powerful man alive today. Imagine the scenario, okay? What if somebody said that you're going to be sitting in the Oval Office in the chair, huh? Like, it's just, what are you talking about? You're crazy. You're going to have that seat? You're going to be sitting in that chair? What are you talking about? 
But this is in essence what the Prophet is saying to Suraqa. You're going to wear the bracelets of Kisra. And even Suraqa said, Kisra a Faris? I mean, are you telling me I'm going to wear the bracelets of Kisra, of, of the Persians? And he said, yes, Kisra Faris. And we all know what happened. Right now we're going to talk about today and next Wednesday. This is exactly what happened. That when the capital of the Persians was conquered, and that capital is called Tesiphon in English, and it is called Madain in Arabic. Uh, and when Madain was captured, so all of the Ghanima was sent to Medina. And in that, and it was literally a pile, literally a pile of gold and jewel in the Prophet's masjid. And Umar ibn al-Khattab came and he went through this pile and he pulled out the two bracelets of Kisra and he said, where is Suraqa? Go call him. And Suraqa was brought and Umar himself put the bracelets on Kisra, on Suraqa just to fulfill exactly what the Prophet said. That one day will come when you will have the bracelets of Kisra on your own hands. And this is what we're talking about basically today. So this is another prediction. Another prediction. So we have right now already three predictions. Uh, and by the way, one could also say maybe in the Quran there's an indirect reference with Ghulibat al-Rum. Indirect, it's not explicit. Because Allah, Allah doesn't say the assassins will be destroyed. Allah says that they shall be overcome in one battle. Or the whole kingdom. The Quran is not clear in this regard, right? The Romans, after having been defeated, shall now be the victors and cause defeat. Okay? So who are they going to cause defeat against? The Persians. So one can say there is indirect but not explicit in the Quran. So we have right now three ahadith. Right? You're all counting. We have right now three ahadith. The fourth one, a fourth hadith, that hadith in Mustad Imam Ahmad, that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that لا تفتحن أرض كسرى عصابة من أمتي لا يفتحن أرض كسرى عصابة من أمتي A small group of my ummah, a warriors of my ummah will open up the land of Kisra. A small group of my ummah, and it was a small group compared to the civilization of the Sassanids which must have numbered in the millions, because the Sassanids are an entire civilization. The number of Sahaba that came in is probably 30,000. And again, these numbers are simply astounding, even for modern historians, especially for modern historians. How could 30,000 people destroy the mightiest civilization? And this is exactly what is mentioned in Muslim Imam Ahmed, that a group of my ummah is going to conquer uh, the land of Kisra. And there's a hadith in Tirmidhi. There's a hadith in Tirmidhi that says, When this Kisra dies, there shall be no Kisra after him. And when this Caesar dies, there shall be no Caesar after him. By the one in whose hands is my soul, you shall spend of their wealth in the way of Allah, meaning in jihad. The very money that is now being used against you, you will spend it against them. This hadith is in Tirmidhi. Now, this hadith is somewhat problematic. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, when this Kisra dies, there shall be no Kisra after him. And when this Qaisar dies, there shall be no Qaisar after him. Why is that problematic? <coughs> there were more Qaisars that came. And in fact, even Kisras, we just said 14 came after his death. Okay, well the Kisra one can easily be interpreted that these 14, they're all, they're not really in power, they're just yani, by title, right, they have no actual, so one could say that, but in fact what do we do about the Qaisar? There's no Caesar after that Caesar, but the Caesar has lasted for, for much longer, so in fact Imam al-Shafi'i was asked this question, Imam al-Shafi'i was asked this question, how do we understand this hadith in light of the fact that there were Qayasira, there were Caesars, after uh, the Caesar of Rome. And Imam al-Shafi'i responded with a response that is considered to be the standard response. And that is that the context of the hadith needs to be understood that the Quraysh were worried that if they accepted Islam, their trade with Rome, or with, uh, not Rome, with Damascus, with Sham, and with Persia would come to an end. That they would become 
boycotted by both civilizations because they have abandoned the, they have joined the process and they've abandoned the ways of their forefathers. So Imam al-Shafi'i said that the Prophet is telling them that they no longer have to worry about the Caesar and the Khusro for their trading routes. That their lands that they're worried about will become in the lands of Islam. I.e. Asham and Faris and Iraq they don't have to worry about Kisra and Qaisar after that. They will now be a part of one civilization. This is Imam al-Shafi'i's interpretation. And that is the standard interpretation that, that um, people give. And then there's one final hadith uh, before I actually get to the history of, uh, of, of the battles that we're going to talk about today. About the predictions. And there's one other famous incident that somebody should remember. About the prediction of conquering Persia. One other famous incident. All of you know it. When I say it, you're going to say, oh, I remember this one now. One other famous prediction. The axe. The axe. The, the uh, battle of Khandaq. The battle of Khandaq. What happened when the Sahaba were digging the trench? They came across a big boulder. Right? And the big boulder could not be broken. They didn't know what to do. And so they called the Prophet ﷺ, who went down himself into the trench. He took the axe from one of the Sahaba. And he said, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and he hit the rock, and there was a big spark. And he said, Allahu Akbar. And he said the first time that I have been given the keys to a sham, and I see its reddish forts, fortresses even now. So the Sahaba said, Allahu Akbar, and one part of the boulder broke away. Then the second time, and this hadith is mutafaq, Bukhari, Muslim, Ibn Ishaq, every book of Sira mentions it. The second time he does it. And he says, Allahu Akbar, I have been given the keys to Faris. And even now I can see the white palaces of Tesiphon, Madain. So he literally mentioned Madain by name. And by the way, obviously we, we believe this, but it is so interesting. The Romans, their fortresses were typically more towards the reddish and dullish color. And so he said, I see the reddish colors of their fortresses. And the Persians, they loved their, their uh, whitish marbles. And to this day, Tesiphon is, I think, 35 kilometers uh, south of Baghdad. Because again, Baghdad back then was under Sassanid rule. We divide Baghdad and uh, Iraq and Iran. But of course, those days, there's basically one large civilization. And Tesiphon was around 35 kilometers uh, it still is, it still is the remnants of some of those palaces and there are the pictures there. These are World Heritage Sites, you can Google them, there are pictures about them. Beautiful beams just coming out of the middle of the desert and they are still white in color. And our Prophet has never been here, he's never been this far. But the hadith clearly says, I am seeing the white pillars of Tesiphon. Or the white castles of Tesiphon, of Madain, and they are white in color. And so the Sahaba said, Allahu Akbar. And then he hit the third time, and which land did he promise the third time? Yemen. 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 And he said, Allahu Akbar, I have been given the keys to Yemen. And even now I can see the gates of the city of Sana'a. Sana'a, I can see it now. And Sana'a was the jewel and the capital of Arabian Yemen. And of course, Sana'a as well uh, fell to the Muslims. So these are all predictions that we should be aware of. That the Prophet explicitly said that Kisra will be the final Kisra. That Allah will break his kingdom up into all of these little mini dynasties and that's it. And it will finish up. That the land of, of uh, the Faris will be ruled by the Muslims. And that Madain in particular, he even mentioned it by name. That Madain will be ours. And he even said the wealth of Kisra will be spent to finance other jihad and that's exactly what happened when all of this wealth came what did Umar do with it? did he build palaces? of course not he financed other conquests so the very money that was used by these mighty emperors was then used to spread the religion of Islam so let us quickly recap things that we've already done the beginning of the conquest of uh, the Sassanids began in the reign of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq when one of the chieftains who is now would now be considered to be somewhere in the Bahrain type of region. His name was uh, Al-Muthanna ibn Haritha. He was one of the chieftains of that region. He accepted Islam and without uh, getting permission from Abu Bakr, he started to raid some of the Sassanid villages. 
And he then came back to Abu Bakr and explained to him that I've done this and it's great success, but I need more people. I need more troops. So this is the time of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And so Abu Bakr al-Siddiq uh, sent Khalid bin al-Walid, who had just come back from the battles of the Yamama. He had, sorry, he had just finished the battles of Yamama. The battles of, uh, what are your battles of Yamama who remind, who remind me? Musaylam al-Kadhab. So Khalid has just finished Musaylam al-Kadhab's battles. And so the Prophet sends him, so, no, sorry, no, Abu Bakr, sorry. Abu Bakr sends him to go towards uh, the Sassanid lands and start fighting the Persians. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was the one who opened the doors to the conquest of the Sassanid Empire. And in the lifetime of, the, uh, of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, Khalid ibn walid achieved some amazing successes. He conquered the great city of Hira, and also the city of, of which is still today Al-Ambar. He conquered Al-Ambar, and most of what is basically almost half or three quarters of modern Iraq. Okay, so what we now call Iraq, at least the first three quarters of it with the Arabian Peninsula, that was conquered in the reign of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. But Khalid ibn Walid could not get to Tasifan. He could not get to Madain. That was beyond his scope for now. And especially because what happened to Khalid? He was called on the other side. Damascus and Jerusalem. He was called on the other side to go and fight in Asham. And so he dropped everything and he took the bulk of the troops and he made his way all the way across and the conquest continued over there. So what do you think the Persians are going to do when Khalid has left? Recover. And that's exactly what they did. That's exactly what they did. When Khalid left and only one third or one fourth of the troops are left in Persia, so the Persians respond back with vigor. And they reclaim much of what the Muslims had uh, taken. So the Muslims end up losing much of the land, not all of it, they still have small strip, but much of the land they ended up losing. And there was in, in particular one especially uh, tragic battle called the Battle of the Bridge. It was called the Battle of the Bridge uh, or the, uh, uh, the Battle of the Jisr. The, the Jisr of the bridge, and that is because quite literally the Muslims were on one side of the Euphrates. Euphrates is the famous river of, uh, of Iraq, and the Persians were on the other side, and obviously there was a bridge in between them. And negotiations began, who's going to cross over? And most of the Muslims said, we should remain so that we have the higher ground and morality. Let them cross over, not morality, morale. Let them cross over and we should stay. But for some reason, Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi, their leader, uh, he said, no, we, we, we don't want to show that we're weak, we should cross over. So, Qadr Allah, they decided to cross over, which proved to be, uh, in hindsight, all of this Qadr of Allah, but it wasn't uh, the way to win the war. And uh, the uh, Persians basically viciously attacked, and the Muslims did not have a escape route, even because the bridge was broken. So somebody even broke the bridge, there was no escape route, and therefore over 4,000 Muslims uh, lost their lives, including Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi, who was the, the leader. And uh, this was also uh, when the Persians, uh, not for the first time, but they showed the Muslims the power of their elephants. So the Persians had mastered uh, training elephants to be elephants of war. So the elephants would actually attack and they would use their tusks and they would use their, 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 um, uh, their trunks to pick people up and throw them down. So the elephants had been trained to be weapons. And the Muslims had, did not have that type of experience. And so this battle of the Jisr, uh, yeah, it proved to be a bit of a disaster in this regard. But Al-Muthanna made it out alive. Abu Ubaidah was killed. In fact, tragically. Abu Ubaid, uh, Abu Ubaid was Abu Ubaid, sorry, Abu Ubaid al thaqafi Abu Ubaid was killed literally by an elephant taking him off of his horse with the trunk and smashing him down and then trampling over him. Like quite literally, can you imagine the, the scenario? And of course this is wreaking havoc in Muslim lines because they have never seen anything like this. They try to go back, the bridge has been cut and it took them a while to get the bridge back up. They had to somehow get the bridge back up. Then finally, whoever is remaining retreated. Over 4,000 Muslims died in this one battle, the battle of the Jisr. And Muthanna barely made it out alive. He's going to die in a few months because of the wounds. But before he dies, he sends a very passionate letter to, now Umar is in charge, and he says, we need help, or else, khalas, we are gone. 
meaning Iraq itself and, uh, and everything is gone. And so uh, Muthanna sends a letter to Umar al-Khattab and Umar decided to go himself. He put on his armor, it is famously narrated that he went outside, he's going to go, and the Sahaba said, you can't do this. You cannot leave us here without a, a head. We need you as the Khalifa. You cannot become a Shaheed. You, you're too precious for the Ummah. So they insisted that he send another person and the decision was made to send Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, one of the Ashara Mubashara. And again, the point is Umar realizes we need quality, not quantity. One of the Ashara Mubashara is precious. Doesn't matter, he's one man, he is worth a thousand men. Okay, so he sends Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and whatever they can muster, because at this time there's wars going on everywhere. So 4,000, majority of them are from the Ansar, because most of the Muhajun are already in, 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 uh, in Bilad al-Sham. So 4,000 men are sent with Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and he gives commands to Sa'ad to go to particular tribes on the way to uh, Persia and get reinforcements from those tribes. So. Even though they leave Medina with only 4,000, by the time they get to uh, the Persian lands, to the Sassanid lands, how many do they have? This is one of those big problems that we have now. These numbers are always inflated. They're inflated on both sides, i.e. depending on who you are and what you're seeing. Nobody's doing a tally. Nobody has a registrar. Nobody has a you know, list and a head count. It's just a guesstimation. And this is one of the big problems that we have. And somebody will say, Astaghfirullah, are you accusing them of lying? No, it's not lying. It's human nature. If you're sympathetic to anything, and you want the number to be more, if I were to ask you, estimate how many people in the room right now, let's say. Okay? If you want more people to be in the room psychologically, you will see more people. And if you don't want too many people to be in the room, you will see less people. Okay? Classic example, when they had the Million Man March recently, Okay, if you're looking at Fox News versus you're looking at BET Network, for example, right? The numbers differences was like three times difference. Three times. Oh, there may be 100,000. Oh, there's uh, 800,000. Like literally this type of difference. It all goes back to perception. It all goes back to... So, unfortunately, nothing, it's nothing about lying or something, but we cannot trust these numbers too much in any book. The Muslims automatically will want to make the enemy much larger. Because they won in the end, okay? And they might make their own little bit smaller because they want to show that they... So this is one of the problems that... And the other side, vice versa as well. The one of the problems that we have, in the Muslim books, it is said that the Persians were maybe 200,000. And this doesn't seem realistic because of many reasons beyond the scope of my lecture here. Maybe there were 60, 70,000 of the Persian side, okay? In the Muslim books, it is said that the Muslims numbered around uh, 30,000. Okay, and maybe they were close to this or a little bit less than this. So, in, but in essence, without a doubt, the Muslims are less than one third or one half or something of the other side. Okay, one third or one half. Clearly, the Muslims are much less than the other side. That's without a shadow of a doubt. Now, the armies are growing, and the Persians realize that these people mean business. And as the armies continue to grow and their positions are getting larger and larger, so negotiations have to begin. What's going on here? Negotiations begin. And in fact, these negotiations last three months. Three months, back and forth. And there are some interesting occasions and interesting incidents that take place. Of them is the most famous conversation that we have all heard um, growing up and whatnot. And that is the conversation between Ribri ibn Amir and between uh, Rustum, who is in essence, he is the one leading because by this time, the one on the throne is Yazdajar III and Yazdajar III is a little kid. In fact, he comes to power when he's eight years old. He comes to power when he's eight years old. Again, you realize, why is this kid on the throne? Because there are people behind him who want to really rule, but they need a token king. And so there are factions within the family of Khusro. Yazdajad is the grandson of Khusro. And there are so many grandsons here. So one general and one person basically chooses Yazdajad and goes, Khalas, you're going to be the emperor. Okay? And Rustum was one of the big guys that chose Yazdajad. So in essence, Rustum is one of the main leaders, not Yazdajad. Yazdajad, he's not eight anymore, but he's still a little kid. He's not the actual, if you like, independent emperor. So Rustum asks for a delegation of the Muslims to come. 
come and let's negotiate. Why are you guys here with 30,000, 40,000 troops? What's going on? And this is the famous conversation that takes place with Rib'i, Rib'i ibn Amir, in which uh, uh, Al-Tabari and, and, and others, they mention in detail what happened. And that is that Rustum uh, commanded that his most finest tent and pavilion be laid out, and all of the fancy rugs and uh, the, the wealth and opulence be displayed so that the emissaries see the lavish lifestyle they live in. So one can only imagine now Persian material to this day, we know that the Persian material is of the finest material to this day. Can you imagine the Sahaba seeing the best of the best, seeing the wealth and the grandeur walking into this, this, uh, this tent city is gonna be now, because this is not the palace right now, this is not Tesiphon. We're gonna get there next week, inshallah. This week we're still, uh, we're talking about the battle of Qadisiyah right now, which is gonna begin. And Qadisiyah was a small village compared to Tesiphon, but it'll open the door to Tesiphon. So this is taking place at Qadisiyah. And they walk in, Rib'i ibn Amr is the head of the delegation, and Rib'i is wearing the same clothes that the Sahaba wear. Tattered garments, patches here and there. He's riding an old horse, that's all he has, okay? His weaponry is sub, sub, sub class. Nothing fancy like the shiny armory that the rest of the, the Persians have. When he comes in, so these Persians are shocked, like these are the people that are attacking us? Because the first conversation. So the guards demand that he come off of his horse and take off his armor and hand over the weapons. You can't come in front of the general, you know, armed. And Rib'i says, you called me. I didn't, I didn't want to come. You called me. I'm going to come the way I am or I'll go back. So they got permission and so he walked in with his horse into the tent. And he walks in with the same tattered clothing and the same what? And he gets off the horse. He ties his horse to one of the carpet endings because there is no pillar you know this is inside the tent okay so he ties the horse to one of the carpet picks up the carpet this fancy carpet uses it for the horses the, the horses reign okay and then Rustum famously asks him why did you guys come like what are you guys doing here go back where you came from I mean let's, let's forget all this happened why are you bringing 30,000 men to attack us? You know you're going to lose, basically. What's going on? And this is, of course, where uh, Rabi'i gave that famous lecture, that famous paragraph. And we've all heard the paragraph, but it opens for us the psychological perspective of why the Sahaba are leaving Mecca and Medina and Hijaz. Why are they going out and conquering these lands? It is not meant for wealth. It's not meant for inherent power. No. As Rib'i said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us لِنُخْرِجَ الْعِبَادَ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الْعِبَادِ إِلَىٰ عِبَادَةِ رَبِّ الْعِبَادِ That famous statement. So that we can free the slaves of Allah. So he called Rustum a slave, which is an insult to him because Rustum thinks he's basically almost the emperor. So we can take free the slaves from the worship of other slaves to the worship of the Lord of the slaves and to free them from the strictness or the closeness of this world to the vastness of the Akhirah and to free them from the injustices of all religions to the justice of Islam. So these are the three reasons he gave. Stop worshipping other than Allah, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And introduce you to the Akhirah rather than worrying about this world and all other systems are dhulm other than the system of Islam and so whoever accepts this from us we accept it from him and whoever refuses we fight him until the promise of Allah comes true so Rustum said what is the promise of Allah and Rib'i says for those who die it is Jannah for those who live it is victory one of the two قُلْ هَتَرَبَّصُونَ بِنَا إِلَّا إِحْدَ الْحُسْنَيَيْنَ we have one of two things if we live, victory. If we die, Jannah. And in both cases, it will be victory. So Rustum, uh, basically, as you know, he did not agree to this and he sent them back. And eventually they ended up uh, fighting uh, the battle of Qadisiyah as we're going to come to. It is also reported that during this time, Umar al Khattab sent a delegation directly to Yazdijard. And Yazdijard is in the capital. This is happening in Qadisiyah. He sends another delegation to Yazdijard. And uh, yes, the judge was an impetuous young kid. He's, a, he's, not, a, he's not a politician yet. And uh, yes, the judge was very rude to 
the Sahaba and the people who were there and all that is mentioned we don't have that much details about the back and forth what we do know is that one of the Sahaba who came his name is Asim, uh, Asim ibn Amr that yes the judge commanded that as they're walking out they should um, they should have a uh, a basket of soil be put onto their heads as a sign of humiliation basically okay so they should just like when they're coming out let people basically put this basket on them so they're like a servant you know to carry to carry something and Asim ibn Amr he took this basket with great pride and he held it up until he came back to the camp of the Muslims and he said Allahu Akbar the emperor has handed us his land on the platter basically he took it as a positive omen that this is a sign and it turned out to be a sign okay so what he wanted to be humiliation Asim said Allahu Akbar this is a sign from Allah that the emperor is willingly handing his soil over to us and it is actually if you think about it it can be interpreted exactly as a positive sign and it goes back to the theological issue of reading in positive omens it is sunnah to read in positive omens we talked about this many times in aqidah class and whatnot so he took the sign of humiliation he flipped it around and he said this is an omen from Allah it's a good sign from Allah that the Sassanid Empire is going to basically uh, collapse and it will be handed over to us so when all the negotiations failed in Sha'ban of 15 AH which is November of 636 November of 636 Sha'ban of 15 AH this is when the Battle of Qadisiyah took place and the Battle of Qadisiyah it lasted four days and uh, the Muslim historians have named each day and we don't have to get into all of that but uh, and all the details are mentioned I'm just going to very quickly summarize that on the first day so um, the Qadisiyah is now in Iraq it's in modern Iraq and it is basically a day away from Tesiphon so Tesiphon will be the next stop which is what we're going to do next week so Qadisiyah in and of itself was not a major city but the battle turned out to be the most important battle because this was the major troops of the Sassanids because this was the big battle so it was the stepping stone to the rest of the entire Sassanid Empire okay so on the first day the Muslims really suffered immense losses and the Persians had around 50 war elephants wreaking havoc in Muslim lines as well the Persian arrows were better and sharper and longer in their reach than the Muslim uh, equivalent because the technology is better on the side of the Persians okay so the Muslim armor as well was not that uh, thick compared to the Persian armor and so the Muslims realized that they needed to basically uh, think about tactics on the second day uh, they got some reinforcements to come from other places because there's multiple mini battles going on so they decided to get some help from other places so on the second day reinforcements are coming in and uh, one of the commanders al Qaqa, uh, decided to use a ruse or a trick to demoralize the Persians so what did he do the contingent that was coming in uh, maybe around 2000 or so he divided them into much smaller contingents and spread them out and told them to come at intervals throughout the day so from the distance it appeared that one cavalry after another is coming more and more reinforcements coming it's never stopping even though in reality it was relatively small but he spaced it out time wise and people wise so that it looked as if more and more people are coming so this is a trick of war uh, a deceit of war that is of course uh, what war is as uh, you have to basically deceive the enemy and that's what the hadith is, al khid'ah, is that that's what war is as well they came up with the idea of scaring the animals of the Persians by using camels and putting some bizarre contraptions on the camels to make them look much bigger and like basically monster beasts and charge into the ranks so that the animals of the Persians had never seen anything like these animals okay and it worked that by putting these contraptions on the camels now imagine these these ideas coming from people that have never been trained in a college of war these are the Sahaba these are not people and these interesting ideas are just coming by 
and they're actually uh, working. And on the second day, it appears that the Muslims are beginning to have the upper hand. So the first day, the Muslims did not have the upper hand. The second day, it looks like they're now changing. The tide is about to be changed. On the third day, it was an all-out. Severe fighting breaks out on both sides, and the Persians decided to launch basically all 50 elephants at once. All of their elephants come out, and in fact, they almost made it to the headquarters of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas was... Uh, his headquarters were in one of the palaces or the, one of the houses of the noblemen. He had converted to the um, uh, to basically a war uh, a room. They almost made it, but the Muslims defended that house and uh, pushed the Persian soldiers back. And Saad said that we need to get rid of these elephants, and he commanded the archers to target the eyes of the elephant and the men to get off their horses and run into the battle. And don't target the enemy, target the elephants, because the elephants are wreaking complete havoc amongst the men and amongst the horses. And so hundreds of Muslims lost their lives, but eventually the elephants were all gotten rid of the battlefield. When the elephants were targeted directly, and the archers are aiming their basically arrows directly at the, the elephant's eyes, the, the swordsmen are cutting off the trunks of the, that's what you're going to do, it's war. You can't be polite and gently here now. Okay, you are the, the, the swordsmen are cutting off the trunks. The men are dashing through and stabbing the elephants with javelins. You have to do this. There's no other way out. And bit by bit as the day goes on, all elephants are basically dead or off the um, battlefield. And on the third day, the battle does not stop. The previous two days, it stopped at nightfall. They've gone back to rest. On the third day, it does not stop. And the entire night, it is said, you could hear the clinking and the clanking of the metal on one another. The entire night, the battle continues going on until after Fajr, non-stop, 24 hours, the battle is going. After Fajr, al qaqa stands up and he gives a rallying call, especially to his tribe, the Banu Tamim. And he says, the, the Fadis don't have the energy that we have now. They all tired out after battle. If we all simultaneously attack, we will have the upper hand. And that is exactly what happened. That after around 30 hours of non-stop battle, the Muslims mustered up that iman that they need to have to win, and they all charged simultaneously at the Persian encampment, and they launched a full-out offensive, and after Dhuhr time, they reached finally the headquarters of Rustum himself. After Dhuhr time, they reached the tent of Rustum, and here there's different accounts of how he died. According to one uh, version, uh, they basically found him dead with lots of wounds on him. So he died basically in the melee uh, confusion. According to another version, a particular uh, uh, person of the Muslim army found him and, and killed him. In any case, the point is, according to both versions, Rustum died. Rustum died, and with the death of Rustum, who was in effect a type of Kisra, as we said, yes, there was a child. It was, in effect, he was one of the main leaders of the coup that had taken place a few years ago. With the death of Rustum, this was a huge demoralizing blow to the Sassanids, and the Battle of Qadisiyah turned out to be a huge success and the first and the major domino to open up the rest of the uh, land of the Persians of the Sassanids. Umar ibn Khattab, as soon as he heard of this, he told Sa'ad, do not rest, do not stop continue on to Madain, continue on to uh, Tasifan, and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas gathered the troops and made it straight from Qadisiyah, he made his way to Madain, and we will talk about Madain because that is a whole long story, uh, we'll talk about Madain and the conquest of Madain, uh, inshallah ta'ala, next, uh, next Wednesday, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, and with that inshallah ta'ala, with any questions, or we can... Yes, go ahead. There is nothing from the Sunnah called Salatul Nasr. 
There's nothing narrated in the hadith about Salatul Nasr. However, at any occasion, you are allowed to pray extra rak'at and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some have called this Salatul Haja, and there is some hadith that they say, the hadith mukhtalaf fi sahatihi, there's an ikhtilaf over its authenticity. But the concept clearly is not problematic. And that is that you are allowed to stand and pray two rak'at at any time and ask Allah for your needs. So if Sa'ad did something of this nature, which is mentioned as you said in the books, there's no, there's nothing, just like when the Sahabi was about to be executed in Mecca, he prayed two rak'at before he died. He didn't hear this from the Prophet but it's something good, like you're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't need a specific evidence to justify praying and making dua. So if you want to call this Salatul Nasr, not a problem as long as you realize it's not the Prophet who told you to do it. It's from the general text of the Quran and Sunnah that you're supposed to pray and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, yes? So, hadith about the woman as the ruler, and if you go with the you know, straightforward interpretation, does it mean that nation will never be <coughs> successful or the time when she is the ruler? You have to ask controversial questions, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, it doesn't say forever. It says, never shall a nation. Yani, len, it's not going to happen. Okay? The question arises, and this, is, this has always been a uh, uh, hadith that has brought a lot of discussion. So what do you do to those nations that have had a female ruler and they seem to be successful? So in the ancient times, you had many female rulers. Even the queen Sheba was a female uh, and even throughout history, there were always times where there were women rulers and the nation seems to be flourishing. Okay, it's happened in the Mamluk time. Uh, it happened in, the, uh, in India a number of times. The Sultan of Bhopal as well was a female. Uh, many times it has happened that there were, it's going to happen in our country, unfortunately. It looks like the reality as well. It uh, looks like there's the only other, not that I'm liking it, but the reality is... My semi-prediction, it shall be this lady that is running. There doesn't seem to be any other viable candidate. Uh, not that she herself is viable, but my point is it's going to be happening. What does this mean? So w one can interpret it in one of two ways. If we follow, if we follow the first interpretation of the hadith. The first is that, as you said, that eventually this nation will uh, perish, that once they have chosen this, that they are not going to be successful, they will cease to exist. Another interpretation is, that falah doesn't necessarily mean GDP. It doesn't mean economic success. It doesn't mean civilizational success of science and technology. Falah can also mean moral success and spiritual success. In which case, one can say that many of the greatest civilizations are already failures morally. You get my point here. So what does falah mean? Then you flih. What does it mean? Yani falah. Aslan in the Quran that the greatest falah is Jannah. Okay, so one could also interpret it in that manner. And then you have the second interpretation of the hadith, which is basically there is no amr. This isn't a command that the Prophet is saying never have a lady in charge. Rather, this is a statement of fact that this nation that has now appointed a lady shall not be successful. And as I said, uh, the reason why I mentioned it is just so that we understand that this hadith has been interpreted in the other manner uh, from the beginning of times. Uh, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. This is one of those things that when the situation arises, we have to talk about it. Otherwise, the less said, the better it is, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah. Yes, go ahead. Ya Sadia, no, Ya Sadia. Sadia was his name. Ya Sadia al Jabal. So, this is from the Karamat of Umar. We'll talk about this, inshallah. I have a section about the specialities of Umar and whatnot. We'll talk about this, the Karamat. And it is actually authentically narrated in the books of, of uh, uh, Musannafat and the works that talk, about, uh, that talk about what the Sahaba said and did. There seems to be an authentic evidence for this. Ya Sadia al Jabal. Ho Sadia, watch out the mountain behind you. So, yes, this does seem to have taken place. And we'll talk about this when we talk about the, uh, the blessings and the fada'il and the karamat and the ahadith uh, about Umar ibn Khattab. InshaAllah, with this, we uh, conclude for today and then we'll come back next.
Um, yeah, it's not Qadisiyah. It's not Qadisiyah. But it did happen in his lifetime, but it's not Qadisiyah. Inshallah. Bismillah.